So, distributing decision support with FIRE. My name is Bryn Rhodes. I'm CTO of Harmonic uh, Health Systems. Um, I've been involved with uh, decision support and quality measurement standards for uh, several years now, working with HL7. Um, up there? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Now can you hear me better? I can hear myself better, too, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> so I've been working with HL7 uh, for several years now, and um, with FIRE specifically on uh, knowledge representation standards, uh, mostly around decision support and quality measurement. Um, so that's what this presentation is about, distributing decision support with FIRE. So, so we'll start with, uh, this is from the CDC opioid guidelines. So these are some opioid overdose statistics. Um, so this is pretty grim. Uh, 40 people die in the United States every day. Um, from opioid overdoses, um, 165,000 since 99. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when this, uh, I think 2014 uh, was when this was prepared, so maybe even higher at this point. Um, so those are, those are directly from the opioid guideline from the CDC. Uh, and for me, this, this is personal. I, I know people that have um, been involved with this, uh, with this epidemic. So. Um, I think this is an important problem, and uh, we've been working really hard on trying to provide an easier way for systems to incorporate this guidance uh, from the CDC. So um, this is the actual guideline, uh, the, the link to that. Um, there's a lot here, right? There's 12 different recommendations. Um, it's very detailed. There's a lot of information. Um, and so what we want to try to do is help formalize that content and be able to distribute that as easily as possible to implementation sites. So how do we go about doing that? Um, so the running example that we'll, we'll look at through this presentation um, is recommendation number five. So this is the overall statement. Um, essentially, when the patient is being prescribed opioids for chronic pain, uh, if the patient does not appear to be at the end of life, and the MME, the milligram morphine equivalent calculation, so that's for, uh, for any given drug, uh, what is the equivalent dosage to morphine? Uh, and there's a calculation that's provided with this guideline that you perform to, to, to get there. Um, if the MME is greater than 50 but less than 90, recommendation to taper. If it's over 90, then, then there's, a, there's a real chance that this patient's at a high risk for opioid overdose. So taper now. So that's the guidance, the, the basic statement of the recommendation. Um, so how do we break that down? How do, we, um, how do you actually implement that within a health IT system? Um, so patient is being prescribed opioids for chronic pain. Uh, so that's quite, quite difficult to infer. Um, there are lots of different cases where patients are being prescribed opioids. And so actually determining uh, how, how, to, how to know when to trigger this and when to not display this recommendation um, is, a, is a touchy subject, right? There are lots of factors that go into it. So one reasonable approach would be um, primary care abuse potential for 80 out of 90 days. Uh, another would be um, the first prescription for an opioid with primary care abuse potential. Um, patient does not appear to be at end of life. Again, that's a, that's a difficult thing to determine, um, especially at point of care. So, um, another, another reasonable approach would be patient is not in hospice or does not have metastatic or pancreatic. Um, so those are, those are kind of the gates to get into this recommendation. Uh, the actual morphine milligram equivalent calculation, um, if we get into this gate and then, then determine that the patient is in one of these categories, uh, then we then we present the provider with options. Um, this is the workflow that we that we looked at and um, came up with in working with providers at uh, um, University of Utah and their their health system there. Um, so this is an overall workflow that allows the provider you know informs them of this guideline, but then allows them to take action based on uh, based on what they feel is the uh, most appropriate response. So. One is just to accept the recommendation, uh, change the dose being prescribed. Two is to uh, indicate that they've considered the risks and, out, and uh, the patient is being prescribed 
um, and they've, they've, they've outweighed, uh, the benefits have outweighed the risk, and so the, the provider indicates that. Uh, another option is that the provider indicates the, the patient's in acute pain and snoozes that recommendation for a month, right? Um, and then another option is the provider says this, this recommendation's invalid and not applicable and provides a reason, and that would be, ideally that would feed back to the recommendation development, um, so. Um, so what's the implementation effort involved? Just in this one recommendation, um, it's quite it's quite difficult. Uh, you know, we've we've already talked about the difficulty in determining just the gates to get into it. Um, but even if you can get the inf the medication information in normalized form, um, you you've got to break down the ingredients for combination drugs and the the tables to get the strengths. Um, can be pulled from Rx norm, but it's quite an involved calculation. There's a lot of effort involved. Um, it's also a constantly maintained table, so there's a lot of effort involved in maintaining that. Um, it's obviously subject to data availability as well um, and, and dispensing information, PDMP registry, so there's a lot of, of issues around that. Um, a reasonable go forward for this project was to base the recommendation on uh, EHR's current med list. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a starting point. Um, the uh, calculating MME then from that prescription information involves calculating the dosage frequency and strength. Um, so you can use Rx norm, but there's a, there's a direct um, implementation effort associated with that. So can't someone else do it, right? So shouldn't, shouldn't the health IT systems just provide this type of functionality? And, and yes, and they do, and there are lots of, there are lots of implementations of this. Um, but pure volume, right? This is kind of a, an example of the types of things that we need to do within decision support. And so there are many more of these kinds of things than any one system can reasonably provide. We wanna, we wanna make sure that there's a way to get this implementation functionality distributed uh, so that communities can, can contribute to it. Um, there's also setting specific factors, right? Every system is going to do things a little bit differently, and so having all of those knobs and switches in a single implementation uh, just increases complexity and, and difficulty. So, okay, but each major system supports customizations. Yes, and they do, but um, it typically requires one-off implementations at each site, and then uh, there's a limited ability to share that implementation and the cost of that implementation between, between systems. So a guideline like this comes out and every system in the country is effectively replicating the implementation effort to build this, this uh, recommendation in. And this is just recommendation number five, right? There are 12 of them in the guideline. Um, they're not all as difficult as recommendation five. We picked that one because it's really quite hard. Um, but, okay, so um, the clinical reasoning module in FIRE is designed to address this, to try to help give a way um, to distribute this type of information using FIRE resources. Um, so it allows decision support content to be shared. Um, it contains artifacts that define the structure of content, so things like um, decision support rules, uh, order templates, um, you can do documentation templates with it, um, even protocols and, and get into workflow definition, but there's, a, it, there's some uh, quite flexible resources available. And then there's libraries in clinical reasoning that define the behavior. So there's a resource that allows you to, to plug in functionality from expressive languages. So um, key resources are that we will look at in this, um, one is the value set. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle, is to be able to share the terminologies involved uh, in, in standardizing the concepts that are used. Um, in, uh, the next is the library, so we'll, uh, we'll look at that a little bit, but you can, you can package the logic in, in, uh, in your um, plan definitions and your rules. Uh, then there's an activity definition that you can use to describe the recommended actions. So you can think of an activity definition as a, a request resource, but for any patient, not for a specific patient. And so um, you can use an activity definition to describe uh, 
the medication you want to prescribe in a particular scenario, um, where a medication would, uh, request would be, for this patient, I want to prescribe this medication. Um, and then a plan definition lets you organize all that into rules. So in this case, we use an event condition action rule that says when some event occurs, if some condition is true, then perform some action. So using that kind of framework of, of resources, this is the overall flow uh, that we worked out for recommendation number five. So it starts with an event, medication prescribed. So in, at the point of care, provider is prescribing a medication. So is this an opioid with primary care abuse potential? Uh, is the patient uh, metastatic or pen, uh, pancreatic cancer? Um, are they on a liquid form opioid? This might be an older version of that. But, um, and then uh, are they in that range where the MME should be addressed? Their, their, uh, their MME is in that threshold. Um, if so, then um, present the provider with the options based on, this, uh, based on this workflow. So everything that's orange, right, is the um, trigger from the EHR. This is where we actually enter the workflow. Everything that's green is uh, an expression, a calculation that, that, that's being performed in terms of the data elements available in context. Uh, and then everything that's yellow over here in the corner is um, the, the result of the workflow. This is the interaction that comes back. So in terms of the resources, um, for this first condition that the patient is being prescribed opioids, we actually define a value set for opioids with primary care abuse potential. And then you just look in the data elements, uh, you look in their medication list. Um, if they're in any, if they have any that are in this list, right, then they're in that, uh, in that case. Uh, and patient does not appear to be end of life. Uh, again, we're using terminology to define the conditions that we're looking for. Um, it's not a perfect match, um, but we also don't want, um, there's a lot of sensitivity around figuring out when a patient is at end of life. And there's, um, you know, just having that in the, in the record isn't always even an option. Um, you don't want to ask the provider every time, so this is something you try. You want to try to infer, um, but uh, it's not a perfect fit. Um, so, an aside about opioid value sets. So, value sets are often distributed as enumerated lists. Um, so, there's a high maintenance and governance cost to just having this list of however many opioids, um, and. Ontologies like RxNorm provide you a way to, to ask that question as an expression, right? Are there, give me all the medications that have this ingredient, as opposed to just maintaining a list that is the answer to that question. Um, but right now, we actually distribute value sets, for the most part, in, in that expansion form. We just share a list of codes. And it's, you know, from a practical perspective, it's, it's an easy solution rather than requiring um, you know, a terminology server that can evaluate that expression. Uh, but there's a, there's a pretty high cost, and there's potentially a lot of optimizations that can be made in terms of the, um, the implementation and the distribution of that content. Um, if you can describe it in terms of that expression rather than in terms of the, just the giant list. So how do we do that right now? Um, so Value Set has some facilities for this, but it didn't support what we were looking for in this particular case. Uh, for RX norms, um, for the opioid Value Set, we wanted exactly that. Give me all the medications that have opioids as an ingredient. And it turns out to be a, a really difficult terminology query, even in RX norm, uh, because of the way, uh, because of the way some of that data is organized. So we're working with terminology on that. Um, there's a, there's a whole lot of information behind that bullet. Um, but uh, basically what we've come up with is uh, a CDC value set profile. And what this does is says, um, it gives you a way to provide the narrative description for the inclusion and exclusion of the value set, uh, as well as a formal description of the actual content of that compose. Um, so what that looks like uh, here, 
This is an example of the, um, I think this one is end of life, actually. Um, or no, metastatic. So this is actually the TQL, which is a, if you're familiar with Apollon's uh, DTS terminology server, this is a language that you can use to, in, to express uh, queries to produce these value sets. So we, we, still do the, uh, we still do the include every code, we still use the expansion so that it's practically distributable. But we also include this information so that as a from a maintenance perspective, um, anyone that has a, an Apollon server can uh, actually run that and reproduce the value set. And we wanna, we're working with um, terminology uh, to try to get that even better, even more shareable, um, but that's at least one step, right, where you have um, the query that produced the value set rather than uh, the expansion. All right. Um, so an aside about process decisions. So throughout this whole process of implementation, how we actually implemented this guideline, uh, there were a lot of discussions and a lot of decision points around what happened and, and why and what the inputs were to those. Um, and these, the decisions won't be the same for every setting. Every setting will have different answers to those questions depending on their environment, depending on their needs. Um, so that's fine. Uh, we think we can still get a lot of value out of sharing the content that we've got, but we need to, we need to surface those decisions that are made in a way that the people that are implementing can understand why those decisions were made along the way. Uh, and maybe they'll make a different decision, um, but at least they can uh, you know, have all of the decision points and all of the reasons and rationale for why the decisions were made in the way that they were. So it makes, it makes implementing the guideline from, uh, it's, it's not a black box. We surface as much as we can of not only the end result, um, but the process to get there. Um, and then it would be great uh, if repositories actually supported semantic indexing based on those types of decisions. So you can you could dig around and see uh, what, what were the um, artifacts that were, imp that were impacted by uh, discussions around a particular, um, a particular topic. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the hardest parts is figuring out what the strength of each component ingredient of a, of a medication is. And so this is the uh, OMTK, we call it that. Uh, it's opioid management terminology knowledge. Um, this is what the University of Utah produced from the RX norm. This is just a, a re representation of all the data from RX norm that's involved in actually getting from a prescription RX norm code to the set of ingredients and components in that with their associated strengths so that you can do this calculation to get the MME. Um, so what's involved with the actual calculation, um, if, you, if you have to distribute that as Rx norm, um, then you've got to have in your engine that does this calculation, it's got to actually hit Rx norm and pull that all, pull that all down. Um, Obviously, you, wanna, you, you don't want to hit Rx norm every time you need to ask this question, so you try to cache that information. So as an implementation, um, they actually cached that offline uh, content from that database uh, and then just do a lookup locally. But that means now that my logic depends on the existence of this database in a certain form uh, that, that has this content. Um, so how do you actually make that portable? I mean, one way is to just distribute it as a portable, uh, a portable artifact. Um, you know, a SQLite database, lots of people can read that. An access database, lots of people can read that. Um, so another way uh, is to embed it in the terminology as a code system supplement. Um, and we're looking at that as an option, but that's not 
possible right now. Um, at least as far as we know, you know, maybe if you have an idea, we'd love to hear it. Um, but the, uh, another option is to actually embed the content in CQL, um, which, again, this is not ideal, um, but what we've got is a CQL library that has this content, so you see the drug code, the drug name, uh, the dose form, and the ingredient, and its relative strength. So for every drug, for every combination in this set of um, drugs that have opioids in them, we record this data and we have a library that's specific uh, to this. Now that content is generated, so whenever the Rx norm data is, is uh, refreshed, we just regenerate that set and distribute a new library, right? So that is isolated to a single library of CQL and provides a way to, uh, a way to distribute that. Again, not ideal, but it's, uh, it's functional in that if you have a, um, it's, as you can see, it's pretty close to just JSON there. Um, so there's about, I don't, I don't know, like a thousand or so of those entries in that library. Uh, so this is the actual portable MME calculation then. Um, so what we, what we do is uh, for each medication, we pull the ingredients back and then we just do the conversion factor on that ingredient based on the daily dose and dose form for that, uh, for that conversion factor or for that um, medication. Uh, and then that gives you the MME um, and we return that. So we use that. Um, you'll notice that this is all done in terms of just the, the core inputs. Um, we, didn't, we didn't express this in terms of any particular data model. We just said um, we need an Rx norm code, we need a dose, uh, and we need the um, quantity and dose per day. This is CQL. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in STU3, when we need to actually use that calculation against uh, the fire data, then we just call it from this OMTK logic library, and we pull out the information we need from the fire resources to pass to that, uh, to pass to that calculation. Um, in STU2, uh, we just do the same thing, um, just using the, the different medication order instead of medication request. Uh, and then we return that to the, uh, to the plan definition, right? So then we have this plan definition that actually describes the condition. Uh, so the trigger in this case is a medication prescribed. Uh, the condition is an applicability that if the total MME is greater than 50, uh, then um, perform this, this action, right? And so what you get is this set of four actions that are then displayed to the user and they pick one, right? Um, so on the condition here, this is a kind of a general pattern for, uh, for expressions within, within FHIR, and we're actually in, in uh, R4 looking at a way, looking at um, using that same pattern more broadly across all of the expressions. But uh, we take a narrative as well as a formal, and so the narrative says, what it actually means from human readable, and then the formal is an actual computable. Uh, and then we specify the language, in this case, text CQL. So this is accessible in this plan definition because I've got a library reference to that opioid logic. And so in this plan definition, I can just say is MME 50 or more because the library is in context. Okay. Uh, so shareable definition, but um, is that executable? So we do have a clinical reasoning implementation that we plug into the Happy Fire server uh, to actually run this. Um, so it's capable of evaluating CQL and then of also realizing these plan definition and activity definition resources. Um, and then it has a CDS hook service endpoint that it puts on the front of that. So um, the way that this actually works then is uh, you have to kind of look at CQL evaluation architecture. Um, so CQL uh, 
is designed to be able to share the expressions involved in, in this logic. So this is just from the, the specification uh, diagram there that ELM is kind of a, an, an abstract tree, an abstract syntax tree that um, defines uh, a canonical form for the logic, right? So that's a machine readable. Um, it's not expected to be consumed or, con or produced by authors. It's intended for machine processing applications. So either you're going to, uh, you know, invoke it natively, or you're going to translate it to some uh, target environment. Um, that's what all those along the bottom are. Uh, you run it in JavaScript. You run it in in uh, in a Java engine, or you translate it to some target language. Um, and then along the top is clinical quality language, which is the the concrete syntax for that. Um, and that's what that's uh, that's what you were seeing. So we have tooling that just translates the CQL to a to that uh, executable format, and then we've got, um, in the case of a of an engine to run this, um, to share logic of any kind, you have these components within whatever system is going to be doing this. So you've got a model that gives you a structured representation of that information. Can't even. You can't even express the logic without knowing what the model looks like that you're, you're expressing the logic against. Um, you've got a data access layer that, you know, you've got to have some way to actually get that information from, uh, from the target system. And then you've got terminology uh, concerned with membership testing and value set expansion for those value sets that we were, that we were looking at. Um, and then you've got libraries that are going to allow you to reuse that logic. How do you actually get that logic loaded, um, actually get it running? Uh, and then the engine is this overall runtime system that performs the calculation. So we feed the logic in, given this environment, and some description for each of these touch points, uh, we, can, we can actually evaluate uh, any given logic. So using that kind of as a description of the engine, that's the Java-based engine. So we use the happy fire structures for the data model. Um, we use the fire data provider to get a fire endpoint. Um, and we use the terminology services within fire uh, to get a fire terminology endpoint. Uh, and then we've got a library loader that will use the library resource uh, and load the actual logic out of that library resource. So now I can. I can post a library to uh, a Happy Fire server and post a plan definition and then evaluate the logic within that plan definition. Um, so this, this overall framework then uh, enables lots of use cases, right? I can, I can calculate PHQ9 total score on a questionnaire. Um, I, can, I can build a medication request that specifies dosage in terms of the body weight of the patient rather than a static value. Um, I can use a request group to apply uh, different tests based on a, a ANC threshold, um, neutrophil count. Um, I can evaluate quality measures, uh, for example, um, and so on. Uh, but how do we actually get that integrated with the EHR? Um, so I've got this thing that can perform these calculations, uh, but I, I'd like to be able to actually call that from an EHR, especially in this workflow, I want to hit this from the medication prescribed. So that's the CDS hooks integration. Um, and what we, uh, what we do is put a CDS hooks endpoint uh, in front of this server that's capable of performing these calculations. So the workflow then is the EHR um, issues a medication prescribe. And on the medication prescribe, hook, we indicate that the data we're interested in is the actual medication. And so provide that, uh, provide that with your request. So when this request comes in, it includes not only the patient data, but the medications that the patient is being prescribed. Um, then we ask the fire server for any additional, any additional medication. Um, we actually do that with a prefetch, so if the EHR uh, n satisfies that prefetch, then we don't have to do that, that callback. Um, but it's critical that that request comes with the 
medication being ordered because that is work in progress and that's not going to come back from the fire server. That's not in the, the EHR's database yet. So this, this hook into the EHR's workflow is actually enabling this whole thing critically because it, we, we would have no way of actually knowing. We'd have to have an app where the, the provider went and said, yeah, here's the prescription I'm, 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 I'm doing and enter that information, right? So CDS Hooks is really enabling this whole workflow um, by providing that work in progress so that we can perform the calculation on it. Uh, and then that really just is, a, is a, an adapter um, for running this plan definition, uh, which hits the CQL libraries and turns the um, request then into a response that contains if they're, um, if they're fine, then there's no response. But if, there are, uh, if they're over that threshold, then those actions that we saw in the plan definition actually get turned into um, CDS hooks cards uh, for a response from the provider. Okay. Um, so some issues with the approach. Uh, current production systems are DSTU2. Um, so we, we started with runtime transformation where we would actually when the CDS hooks call came in, it was giving us DSTU2 data, and we would run time transform that to STU3. Um, we ended up uh, with different versions uh, for each version of Fire we support. Um, the core of the calculation is independent of the Fire version, and so it was easier just to, to accept an STU2 version of the resource uh, and then call into the same library to do the, the calculation. Um, so, Obviously, we're still working out kinks. Um, there are issues that we that we've been running into with uh, running Happy Fire and multiple versions in the same process. So, um, but those are those are kinks. Uh, it's not an ideal solution, but it's functional. Uh, and moving forward, um, when you get you know you would you would surface different versions depending on uh, what your client was actually consuming. So. Um, it is a problem that we think uh, we think is addressable. Uh, and then another issue is that the, the U.S. core Argonaut profiles that the systems um, support don't provide enough specificity. Um, so we define medication request, uh, a profile on that, to ensure that we're actually getting data in RX norm code uh, and then dosage and frequency information. Right. So. Um, We've got a profile that derives from the U.S. core profile that adds that, that, adds that information. Um, it turns out that most of the systems are already giving us that, um, but there are, there are also things that um, University of Utah actually built uh, an additional poll um, because there was some information that was not coming back in the medication request. Um, but that's, uh, right, assuming we, at least we, with this medication request profile, can say, in order to run this logic, you're going to need the RX norm code, and you're going to need the dosage and frequency information. So, uh, all right. So then, uh, as a general implementation, um, plan definitions in the associated libraries uh, are written in a pattern that you just can plug it in dynamically. So if you build the library and you build the plan definition, and then you post that to the server. Um, then all of a sudden a new uh, CDS hooks endpoint will show up and you can just call that endpoint, right? So we currently have um, Zika management, uh, the six recommendations for um, the CDC opioid guidance, those, uh, those six. Uh, and then we also have um, colorectal, cervical, and breast cancer screening decision support, just as kind of examples um, that are based on uh, the uh, heat is quality measures in that in that area. So we're working with um, uh, the different sandboxes to try to make sure that um, when they call the CDS hooks that we get uh, we get the right answer back. Um, so rough edges remain uh, to be sure, um, but welcome to submit a pull request. So the resources uh, we have um, the this is the current draft version of the um, CQ framework opioid CDS uh, for uh, the CDC opioid prescribing guide. 
Um, that is constantly being updated. We're very close to, to finishing that out. Um, there's some, there's a, some more documentation that needs to be added. Um, but if you actually go there, um, uh, for each recommendation, we actually, oh, no, you guys aren't seeing that. Let me move that over there, because that's, that's worth looking at. Um, so for each recommend, that's, that's maybe a little, there. Uh, for each recommendation, we give that information um, kind of a narrative of what's going on, uh, the, the workflow, um, and then the actual content. So this is links to the libraries and the plan definition resources. So it's a, it's a full implementation guide um, that provides uh, resources for um, actually building this, this functionality into uh, a health system. So... Um, so there's also a HEDIS fire implementation guide. Uh, there's a publicly available um, clinical reasoning test server. Um, so if you hit that, uh, you, that's one of the servers you can actually post the plan definition to and it'll, and it'll run. Um, there's also a, uh, a CDS hook server running on that endpoint. Um, so that's one of the ones we're using in the track uh, to try to get um, communication with. Uh, there's also some walkthroughs uh, on this wiki here um, where you can actually step through all the components involved uh, and, um, and get some, some code there. Uh, there are also some starts uh, in, the, in the repository there that you can, um, just simple Java projects that you can download and compile and get the, get the calculations running uh, in those starts. Okay. Um, so that's... That's it. Questions? Sure. Um, yes, in fact, this use case is asking a question. Um, and one of the one of the answers that we want to be able to support right now is I don't think this decision support is right, and I want to tell the the medical system, the medical, you know, CMIO of my organization, that this decision support isn't quite right, and here's why. Um, we don't have a way to actually turn that back through CDS hooks right now. Uh, that is on the list um, for the specification, but it was outside the narrow focus of a 1.0. Um, so we, uh, yes, um, and I actually, in this, in this use case, uh, what the University of Utah did um, was actually implement that functionality, the snooze, uh, outside of um, the CDS hooks request response. So they kind of have a, um, a custom implementation of that. Um, so it's definitely something we, we, uh, we want to be able to do. In a, in a CDS hooks response, you can return a request, um, but currently the systems don't... Uh, do anything with that. Um, in this example, um, we want to actually say on the naloxone recommendation, um, change your, uh, here's a prescription that we suggest you use. And we will return that as a medication request, um, but right now the, C the, uh, the CDS hooks, or the EHRs won't actually process that. We're working with them to, to push that use case forward as well. So. Yeah, expression logical model. Yeah, it's so really that, creative. Is that a product that you're no, or no. I, so it's an HL7 standard. So it's part of the clinical quality language specification. Okay. Um, that that's. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't go into much detail on that because it's, you know, that's kind of just a, a whole different topic. But the. Uh, um, the CQL specification defines the syntax as well as the machine readable um, exchange format for that logic. So, um, CQL.hl7.org, there's a whole bunch of, of information on it there. 
Okay, any other thoughts, questions? All right. Thank you very much.